Hi, everyone, and welcome to Tell Me About Podcast, where each week, two nerdy friends deep dive random topics. I'm Laura. Do, 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 do. And I'm Tom. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and this is episode number 31. We want to, as always, thank everyone for listening, for subscribing, for following us on social media. Uh, we also want to thank you for sticking with us here as we uh, go through May. Like I said, uh, we're still going to be doing the every other week for just a little while longer. But like I said, once we have probably by our next episode, we'll have a better idea of uh, how the summer is going to look. So we will get that to you when we can and just keep an eye out on our socials on our YouTube page. Now that everything is kind of calmed down for both of us, we're going to get back to posting on YouTube. We're going to have more clips. We're going to have more full episodes. You guys seem to be really responding to the clips, so we'll get more clips out there that we can. Like I said, just keep liking, rating, and reviewing us um, so that we can keep growing this thing. So you heard me humming before, and uh, we figured now was as good a time as any to do a little bit of a dive into commencement speeches and graduations. Uh, odds are uh, you have heard one commencement speaker or another in your life. And they may or may not have been memorable. The trend of celebrity commencement speakers is actually fairly new, only within the last couple decades. The idea of a commencement speech really goes back to about the 1600s, the early days at Harvard. Back then, it was usually just civic leaders or politicians or British royalty that were the commencement speakers. Usually the speakers were the actual students themselves in fact it was called commencement because you were commencing your work career capitalism capitalism it's great it definitely has to be an episode of our podcast if tom has to work in how much he disdains capitalism <laughs> okay now you put me on a watch list but fine i mean capitalism is what it is and i'm just gonna leave it there the idea of commencement grew through the 1700s, 1800s, and you started to see more literary authors start to give speeches. You're going to see the name Harvard come up here a lot because Harvard is kind of where a lot of this originates. They had, I believe, the father of Virginia Woolf give a commencement speech at Harvard. It really explodes during the 1900s, and you have these notable speeches by politicians during the 1900s, for example, JFK gave two very notable speeches at American University during his presidency in the 1960s, in 1962 and 1963. Winston Churchill gives his famous Never Give Up speech at a commencement in England in 1943. George Marshall essentially lays out his, the Marshall Plan for trying to stem communism after World, World War II at a commencement speech in 1947. But the idea of the celebrity speaker, the pop culture speaker, whether it's an athlete or an actor or a musician, really doesn't happen until the mid-60s, 70s. No one really knows who was the first or when it started, but it just kind of explodes. So back in 2015, NPR does a list of the best commencement speeches of all time and more than half of them are from 2010 onward now there are some before that but basically everyone from margaret atwood to steve uh, colbert to former president obama and both president bush's give speeches chuck norris gave a speech that must have been one hell of a speech it was at liberty that's the jerry falwell school Oh, well. Yeah. Okay. You can probably guess where that one went. But the reason why I wanted to bring this up today was commencement speeches have been in the news for a couple of different reasons. As we're recording this, I'm sure you're aware of comments a, um, how do we say, professional football player made at a university. We're not really going to get into that here if you follow the news you know who we're talking about and if you are a fan of this podcast you can probably tell 
you probably have a good idea of where we fall on that side of the debate. And we'll kind of put that aside and leave that there. And Lord knows he's not going to be the first or the last to say something controversial or stupid at this time of the year. For every good commencement speech is about 10 bad ones. There are a couple that I want to bring up today and a couple that are really, really good. And one that was in the news recently that was really, real not offensive bad, just funny bad. <laughs> Absolutely funny bad. Let's start with usually what goes into a commencement speech. Let me ask you, Laura, do you remember who your commencement speaker was? I do not. Now, I had a college graduation and a graduate school graduation, and I could not tell you who it was. I honestly, like, I went to both ceremonies, but they were very much a blur. Like, it was very surreal. I just wanted to be done and move on. So I don't really remember super well, but I don't think that they were anybody famous or at least that inspirational, you know. It's funny you mentioned students giving commencement speeches because we usually see that more at the high school level. And I do have to say, thinking about my high school graduation too, included in this, like that was the one that was most memorable for me just because, I don't know, I just remember it being very emotional and just feeling like that there was this milestone and you were like moving on to adulthood and life and college and everything else that, you know, was coming next. So that was probably the most emotional one for me. But in terms of commencement speeches, I couldn't tell you. I think for me, I don't know, maybe you felt the same way. High school graduations tend to be more for the students because it, it's it's kind of a passage into that kind of like neutral zone between being a child and being an adult. Depending on how old you are, you, you may not be like legal voting age when you graduate high school. So you're not a kid. You're not really a teen anymore, but you're not an adult. It's this weird kind of rite of passage. Like I think college and, and law school graduation, or, well, mine was law school, or grad school, college, grad school graduations, what have you. I think those are more for the family. In college, you're maybe graduating with what? four, five, six hundred people, you know, maybe like a thousand, depending on if it's a, like a university wide, like, did you have, we broke ours up by, by like school. Yeah, us too. So like, we didn't have just like a, a massive graduation for like the like one ceremony for the entire university. It was broken up by a major. And I know in like a, most high schools, the classes are the same, you know, like the same size, but it just feels more intimate. You're not in a massive arena or an, au or an auditorium. You're usually just like on a high school field. It just feels more intimate and it feels like it's more for just you. And you've grown up with these people, most of them, and most of them are your neighbors too. So it's just a different feeling. Uh, we actually are university uh, the College of Com had Ken Burns, the filmmaker, as our speaker. I remember you telling me you were very inspired by his speech. Um, what it lacked in inspiration, it made up for in just prescience. Because he basically said, what I can recall was basically, the pe previous generation fucked it up for you, and you're going to have to pay for it, but it's going to make it the next generation better. Basically, you're going to do all the work, and they're going to get all the reward out of it. Millennials. Fun times. Law school, we actually had the mayor of Boston speak, Marty Walsh at the time. He had just taken over for uh, Mayor Menino, who I, I think had died in office. And Menino was the mayor during the, the marathon bombing. And Walsh had taken over, and he, he actually had a very nice speech about overcoming adversity and overcoming, you know, I think, he had some personal demons in his life that he had overcome. Those were mine, and I don't really remember. And it's funny, too, when you watch some of these speeches, because now you can find a lot of these speeches on YouTube, right? You can go and look them up. And if you notice, when they show the students, they're paying attention, but they're kind of not. 
They're all just kind of just staring through them while they wave at the cameras. And you see them, they're all just kind of just standing there. I think at that point, I think you're just so emotionally exhausted by that point. When it's a college or, or grad school, you just want to get it done. Yeah. And that, that kind of echoes what I was saying before. Like, it's just a blur. And it's like, who is this person speaking? Can we just get to the end of this? Yeah. Like, I remember it took forever to call up all the names. Like I said, it's not for the students. It's it's for the families. It's to see them watch you get called up on stage and uh, and get your diploma. And with that, you want to break down some speeches? Let's do it. So the first one I want to talk about is one of my favorites, and it's Conan O'Brien at Dartmouth in 2011. Now, just to give you a little bit of context, uh, he had done a, a speech at Harvard before. He is a Harvard graduate. And the Harvard speech was, I think, in 2000, and he had talked about you know, not being afraid to fail and the leaps he had taken, whether it was taking the leap to be the uh, NBC late night host to replace David Letterman or taking the leap to be a writer on The Simpsons or, or you know, doing some of the things he's done in his career. We fast forward and in 2011, he talks a lot about a very public humiliation he had. And if you're of a certain age, you remember that he was supposed to take over The Tonight Show. Until he didn't. And it was very public. And it was in the news. And you had Dave Lerman saying, whatever you do, folks, don't blame Conan. And everyone kind of saw Jay Leno as a scuzzball. Myself included. I really, I felt so bad for Conan in that situation. He really got fucked over. Fucked over is, is putting it mildly. And Howard Stern had a field day. All of this just justified everything he thought about Jay Leno for years. It was something to see basically everyone turn on Jay Leno to the point where I don't think his show was really ever the same after that. The speech is, I think, is quite frankly fantastic because it starts with the usual kind of off the wall Conan and he's making fun of New, of New Hampshire and He's making fun of, you know, he does his research and this and that. And he's talking, making fun of Dr. Seuss. He's talking about writing for Flusel with the noozle. Then he goes into talking about they're going into a tough job market. Again, this is spring of 2011. And he makes a reference to parents. You have to be patient with your children because they're going to be looking for jobs that aren't available because if everything, if we know anything, we all have to deal with baby boomers who will not leave their jobs. And this is almost a word for word quote. We'll we'll go in on the YouTube. We'll go in and we'll I'll put in the 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 actual audio on this. But he goes, you can search online right now. Even when they promise you they're going to leave their job in four years, you can go online and hear him do it on television. There's no guarantee they will not come back. He used, as always with Conan, he uses humor to make a point. And he talks about how failure can be used as a tool for reinnovation. And he talks about how he suffers a very public humiliation. And he talks about how it caused him to re examine his career. He talks about trying new things. He talks about his comedy tour that he did with Andy Richter after the show got canceled. If I'm not mistaken, I think at this point, he either had just started the TBS show or he was going to later that year. It was one or the other. He, I think he hadn't started the TBS show yet. I think that was either that later that year or the year after. And But he talked about how he had more fun than he had ever had that year where he just tried a bunch of shit. I remember following him on Twitter. It was just... It was the chronicles of a man who was getting up at 1030 every day to watch Cartoon Network and eat fr eat Fruit Loops. But he used a very public failure to kind of reinvent himself and to grow and to learn as both a, a human and as, as a professional comedian. Because he talks about how everyone his age wanted to be either Johnny Carson or David Letterman. But... There was only going to ever going to be one Carson. There was only ever going to be one Letterman. 
and but it, and it's in finding that out that you learn about yourself and you create your own path and that is i think incredibly important because it's it's all about finding your own way you know i'll tell a story laura knows this that i had been at my current job for 6 years and that was a job that was in a lot of ways treated me very well uh they were nothing but kind to me and they treated me very well but it was also getting to a point where i knew it was time to move on and it took a lot of persuading a lot of it from laura to get me to a point where i couldn't be afraid to fail anymore i had to bet on myself and within a couple of weeks i basically i had a a new job that was better than i could have imagined and listen at the end of the day it's a job you know and a job is doesn't define you but at some point you have to be willing to take a leap and you can't be afraid to fail one of the things you're going to hear you hear a lot in these with these speeches is you cannot be afraid to fail he brings that up a lot conan denzel washington when he spoke at penn about 15 years ago talks about instead of having something to fall back on something to fall forward on what conan did what i loved was that he said why you should be afraid to fail you should do your very best to try to avoid it whenever you can. So essentially like have courage, but don't be stupid. Pretty much. You have to be willing to take a leap because you are going to fail. We all fail. We, whether that's personally, professionally, at some point we're, we will all fail. And what matters really is not how you fail or that you fail at all. It's, being able to learn from it, to grow from it, and use it as an opportunity to reinvent yourself. When you're talking about a good speech, there's really, there's usually there's humor, there's truth, and there's wisdom. And the couple of ones I'm going to bring up that are really good examples of this really do a nice job of blending in humor and truth and wisdom. You know, another one that I really liked was Randall Park. Who had spoken at spoken at UCLA, which was his alma mater, Randall Park. He, he's an actor. He's a comedian. He do, he did the Marvel Agents of Shield show. Uh, he's part of like the Marvel MCU. He was he did Fresh Off the Boat, which is a really success a successful ABC sitcom for a number of years before they had Abbott Elementary. If you're an Office fan, he was Asian Jim. And if you remember that, congrats on you for not seeing race. That was one of the best cold opens of the show. Absolutely. I I didn't see that. I don't remember watching that episode and I saw the clip and that was, that might be my favorite. Forget about cold open. That might be my favorite prank of all time. I mean, the lengths that they went to for this, like it was pretty genius. Uh, but he talks about how sudden changes in his life led to amazing results. You know, he talks about being cast in the interview which was the movie that caused a firestorm about 10 years ago because it was supposed to be about North Korea. That was the Seth Rogen, James Franco, North Korea movie that then got leaked and North Korea threatened Sony and ended up being pulled. And he talks about how it was a disappointment that it was, the movie was basically shuttered, but because of that movie, it got him to fresh off the boat, which was a very successful sitcom. You know, he talks about the sudden shock of learning his daughter was on the autism spectrum. How that came an opportunity to, for her to grow into, into this wonderful person. Another thing you're going to see a lot with these speeches is change can be scary, but it can also be good. Because, like I, I'll relate it back to my job, I had become very comfortable and I needed that change. Well, the next speech I want to talk about was Mindy Kaling's at Harvard Law. So Mindy Kaling, of course, from The Office, hers was incredibly funny. You know, by her own admission, it wasn't extremely deep, but it was incredibly funny, including up to including her constantly hitting on a professor. Hers was fantastic. You got to be able to tell jokes, too. <laughs> you gotta, like, like, you have to be able to have 
levity and you have to be able to tell jokes that are going to land. I have always really loved Mindy Kaling. I always thought she was super smart, really funny. Just seeing everything that she's built for herself, including her own show and everything that she's done in her career. And I, I've, I've seen that speech and it is very funny. And like you were saying, I think these speeches have to be a good balance between humor and inspiration. But I also think there has to be that bit of vulnerability, like Conan talking about the humiliation he went through or Randall Park talking about his daughter's autism. Like speaking about that publicly, like that takes vulnerability. So I think appealing to the students and the families and the audience that way, the more successful the speech, it usually has those three items in it. Well, it just leads to authenticity. If you're able to be vulnerable with the audience, they're going to be more receptive to you. You know, Denzel Washington at Penn talked about how that was one of the first times he was actually talking to a large group of people. You know, when a large group of people usually were uh, listening to him, they weren't really listening to him. They were interpreting him through his movies or what they were watching on, on the screen. So you're right. I never thought about that, that most of these people have only been exposed to like the film sets or the TV sets or like a smaller comedy club. And they haven't talked to this number of people before. So yeah, I never thought about that. And you can tell when you're watching his, you can tell he's nervous. You can tell that, that the fact that he actually has to, I'm not saying this as a negative, but the fact that he's talking to a group of people, talking directly to them and looking at them is kind of unnerving. I had to give a best man to toast at a wedding a week ago, and I was sweating bullets before I, I gave that speech. I can't imagine having 10,000 people staring directly at me, hoping for a reaction. And that's crazy to think about. Like Denzel is huge. He's a huge movie star and he was nervous. Like that's crazy. Well, and he, did, he didn't say he was nervous, but he goes up. He's like, all oh, my papers are all over here. He was, he, like he was trying, he was actually like he had lost his place. And you can tell like he was a little unnerved by having to do that. I, I doubt that was intentional, but in a way it was almost, it was very humanizing. It connects with them more. Again, it comes back to authenticity. He even joked about how because he was in Philly and he's from New York that he wore all his Yankee stuff, everything except his Yankee cap, and he got booed. You know, but again, but he talked about his vulnerability. He talked about almost failing out of Fordham, that he had a 1.7 GPA at Fordham when he was an undergrad, and they asked him basically to take some time off. Imagine telling that to, to a guy who ends up however much many millions of dollars he's worth now academy award winning actor and they tell him oh yeah you know college may not be for you the last one i really wanted to talk about in a positive way was chadwick boseman who was spoke at howard about six years ago and a couple of years before he passed away you probably know him from black panther from from all the marvel movies he also played jackie robinson he played james brown he did a wonderful job with those as well. He had a wonderful speech, and which I think he did while he was sick, and no one knew it. His speech, one, it aged incredibly well, because he talks a lot about how Howard, which is this, if you don't know, this historically African-American black college in Washington, D.C., is literally on a hill. And it's talking about reaching the hilltop. And it's talking. And he was talking a lot about being authentic and true to oneself. So he talks about at the time there had been uh, student protests at Howard, and they had basically gotten the administration to listen to them and negotiate with them to come to an agreement. He talks about when he was a student at Howard that he had protested and had gone as far as I think they had actually taken over a building. His was about. There had been talk about combining the the departments and kind of watering down the curriculum, especially the fine arts department, which he, which he was in. And this was a fine arts department that had produced, uh, among others, Felicia Rashad, who was a Howard alum. 
and it's incredibly relevant now considering what's going on in college campuses all across the world right now. Uh, but he talks about the importance of listening and the importance of being true to oneself and the importance of knowing who you are. It makes it even more incredible that no one knew he was sick when he gave that speech. And he's up there for 30 minutes just connecting with every single one. And you could see when they pan to the crowd, people are nodding. They're crying. They're He connected with every single one. When you can do that, that's something special. I don't think I've seen that speech, but just knowing him and kind of like the person he was, I imagine that it was very inspirational. You know, I got a little emotional watching it. I mean, one, because we lost him way too soon. Someone put out a tweet, I think it was yesterday, and there was a clip of him doing all the stunts from one of the Avenger movies. They said the guy had stayed for cancer when he shot that. Like, that's unbelievable to think about. By all accounts, he was an amazing person, an amazing, extremely talented person. But his was fantastic. He had everyone riveted. The reason why I mentioned those before is this was the real reason I wanted to do commencement speeches this week is I wanted to get into this. I'm not going to be able to get through this without laughing. There was the uh, Ohio State, which likes to kind of pride itself as the Harvard of Harvards, basically the end-all be-all of academic life around the world. It's a, it's a whole thing. They tried to trademark the because they want to refer to themselves as the Ohio State. That's stupid. Yes, it is. The other thing, too, is I'm sure a lot of these universities do the same thing. There's usually like a board that decides who they're going to let speak, and there's usually like a list of names. I mean, Ohio State has had everyone from former presidents to LeBron James do speeches, do the commencement speeches. They, and when I say they, I mean the university president, a guy by the name of Slapshot, that's his nickname, Slapshot, decides to give it to a former alum who is, quote unquote, a social entrepreneur. I think you can kind of see where this is going. What does that mean? What does social entrepreneur mean? I think in this case, it means YouTube guy that fell into a lot of money making Bitcoin. Ah, that makes sense. <laughs> So depending on what circles you run in, you may have heard about this speech given by a guy named Chris Pan. He called himself a social entrepreneur, investor, keynote facilitator, and musician and inspirational speaker. A lot of this is going to come from an article from a, a news site called The Rooster, which is covers Ohio politics. They described it in what many attendees described as the worst commencement speech ever. So it started apparently with him not believing that they were calling him to do the commencement speech. They then had to literally get on the phone and convince him, no, this is real. We want you to be our commencement speaker. Okay. If he can't even believe that they chose him, probably says that it's not the right person. Probably. We then get to the week before him publicly posting drafts of the speech on Instagram, which he admittedly wrote while high on psychedelics. And not just like any psychedelics, ayahuasca, which is the stuff that Aaron Rodgers is using. I'm so proud of you that you pronounced that correctly. Did I get it right? You did. You did. I'm very proud of you. It was the whitest way to pronounce it, but I pronounced it right. Hooray. And I didn't even take one Duolingo course to do it. Can I just say to you, Ayahuasca, I've never done it, but I've heard that it's like some serious shit. And you're not in your right mind. You're hallucinating. You could be vomiting or other things. And really not the right mindset to be in when you're writing a commencement speech. I'm not in that world, but I would assume so. Yes. I should also mention he's a former McKinsey bro. What does that mean? Like, it, that's like the notorious, like, finance bro people that, like, basically keep getting arrested for fraud. Oh, gotcha. Or, like, former Enron employee. 
Shout out to our Enron episode, still number one. He tried to make multiple references in his speech to the Gaza conflict and also showed up at one of Ohio State's campus protests with a ukulele. This is all in the week leading up to the speech. Sometimes a protest just needs to be lightened with music. I think you believe that when you are just tripping off your balls on ayahuasca. Yeah, probably. He tried to do a shirtless dance number during the commencement that was taken out by the university. He essentially tried to turn it into a 30-minute infomercial for Bitcoin because he runs a Bitcoin company, which I have a couple thoughts about that. One, if you're still absolutely pushing the Bitcoin in 2024, God bless you. That's real commitment to the bit there. I absolutely agree with that sentiment. Like, what the fuck? Like, the Bitcoin, like, phase, the NFT phase is completely, that bubble has burst. But God damn it, he's going down with the ship. And the thing, too, that gets me is these are very, very young adults, still super impressionable, probably not great with money. Like, that's not a good message to give these kids or young adults. When people go to a, he, want to hear a commencement speech, they don't want to be tried to be sold on Bitcoin. Exactly. It's not, it's not an infomercial. By the way, the, the rooster story actually links to version 8 of, to the eighth rewrite of the speech, which includes this incredible Microsoft Word comment. Move this to before... The singing, so those who identify as alpha males will buy in more. Anytime you can reference alpha males. You're headed in the wrong direction. Let's just say that. You're heading in a very dangerous direction. It also apparently inc included this line. What if you replace the word racism with hate? That is the root problem. And it is not just racism happening. A lot of other isms too. This guy must have been high off his balls. Yeah, I told you, it's some serious shit. Now we get into the real part. We get into, now we get into the, the hard sell on the Bitcoin. I need you to keep an open mind on Bitcoin. It's a very misunderstood asset class. You could hold them in your retirement accounts just like you hold the S&P 500. This isn't a commencement speech. It's a timeshare. Like he's basically trapped about 20,000 people and their families essentially like in the hotel ballroom trying to sell DVDs. I would be so pissed if I were these students or these families. Like this is, this is what we get. This is our commencement speaker. It's at this point when people started to openly boo. He was literally booed. And when he got into the Bitcoin, people audibly groaned and booed. I tell you what, if my dad was there, he would start yelling some stuff. He then tried to lead the entire commencement class and their families in a chorus of what's going on by four non-blondes. And I think Kumbaya with his ukulele, which then led to more audible groans. So let's see. So far, I'm not seeing humor, really, or inspiration. Or any vulnerability. So we're striking out on all three of those. They posted a tweet from someone who was there that said, literally, the speaker at Ohio State commencement was literally a Bitcoin shell and scam artists selling jewelry and saying to sing instead of taking antidepressants and how Lithuania became independent by singing. Finishes, someone died at commencement and this speaker was more tragic. Holy fuck. Did somebody actually die? Tragically, someone actually died. Oh, God. Like, this was a really, really bad graduation ceremony. Like, I, someone actually, I think, fell off the bleachers. Oh, no. And, and died. But when you have people saying that this was worse, another attendee reported students dazed and confused during his final sing-along to This Little Light of Mine. When he asked students to stand, if you feel so inspired, 
he did not observe anyone around him making an effort to stand. All right. The problem with that statement is that this was his last sing-along. So that the fact that there were multiple sing-alongs in a commencement speech, and this isn't kindergarten, graduation, like, I just, okay. Like, this wasn't a commencement speech. This was a Chuck E. Cheese party, and not even a good one, a depressingly shitty one. So I think it's safe to say he will not be invited back, or to any other commencement speeches, hopefully. I mean, who knows? He invited students to an after party at a at a Presbyterian church after that that he owns. Okay. So basically, you can kind of see how this went off the rails really bad. It should also be noted the school president who first tried to claim he didn't knew, know who he was and how he got picked. It then later came out, picked him himself by hand. And also, the school president may or may not be on the board of trustees for a Bitcoin mining company. There it is. There it is. And listen, Laura, you and I, we're, we're both adults. We've been to enough graduations in our lives. I don't think anyone wants to go to a commencement for their kid or their friend, or if, you're, it's, if it's your graduation, and basically hear a self-proclaimed YouTube star try to sell Bitcoin to you. I mean, did anybody walk out? Do you know? I don't know if anyone walked out. I know there were audible groans and boos. I mean, I don't think it was like Duke where people walked out of Jerry Seinfeld's speech. I mean, I know that was a completely different scenario, but I don't think there anyone did that. I think they just booed. I'll post a link when we post it on YouTube and on our socials i will post a link to that story if you get a chance to read it please do it is it's absolutely incredible i do have to say the article was pretty funny and well written i did enjoy the article probably a lot more than i would have enjoyed the speech yeah the speech was a train wreck but kind of like a funny train wreck I guess he, he succeeded in the fact that people aren't going to forget that. And I think somebody in the article, and correct me if I'm wrong, said that it was so bad that it was kind of good. And it's like, uh, was it though? I mean, that was also, he goes, it sucks for my brother that this was his graduation. That ruled. So I, I don't think as much as it's so bad, it's good as much as it was just one kid dunking on his brother. It is absolutely incredible. Just think, it could be worse, folks. It could be that. Now, there's a whole separate part of this, which is the president who actually picked him. Suffice to say, and we can get into this, the president is very unpopular. He was, he was picked for certain reasons. Basically, the mega donors wanted someone anti-woke and so they got him there's one mega donor who basically has his name on every building at the university and in the city of columbus his name shows up on certain flight manifests for a certain individual i think you know where i'm going with this there's an incredible backstory of kind of lo all politics are local as to how this happened especially when this is a university with enough cachet that they pretty much could have gotten whoever they wanted to be a commencement speaker. I have a question about that now that you say that. Do they get paid at all to do this? Do you know? It depends on the school. Ohio State does not pay. Okay. It probably goes, knowing Ohio State, it probably goes into the athlete fund because, you know, sure, that might have been embarrassing to the university, but you know what's more embarrassing to the university? Losing to Michigan two straight years in football. That shit just cannot happen. But some schools do. Like, for example, I think Matthew McConaughey got $100,000 or something like that to speak at Texas. There were a couple others that made about, again, it was like six figures. So a lot of schools do pay. And I guess the lesson here is if you pay, you're going to get a better class of speaker. And not a Bitcoin shell. 
which is something else that I wanted to bring up, which is kind of related to this. How do you feel about celebrities, whether they give a commencement speech or not? Usually I think they do getting honorary degrees. How do you feel about that? You know, I never thought of it. I think it would have to depend on the celebrity and the university. If it was my school that was giving like, what are the Kardashians an honorary degree? I'd probably be a little pissed. And that's not to say that, that it's nothing against the Kardashians. It's more just, I spent $200,000 or however much it was to get this degree. And they literally got paid to get a better degree. So what I'm gathering of what you're saying is there is a situation where you think that it's fine or earned in some way. So I guess my two criteria are, one, is it someone who has a tie to the school? So is it an alumnus? Is it someone who either went to the school or has ties or connections to the school? That would be the one thing. The second is, by my own admission, extremely subjective is whether I like them or not. If I don't like them, I probably will not be as thrilled with it. So every honorary degree needs to be approved by Tom. I mean, yes, but again, that's only with my school. When it's not my school, if they're paying them to give a speech and get an honorary degree, I guess I do kind of have a problem with it. Like I said, it's one thing if they're an alumni of the school or they went to the school, they have a connection. That's one thing. But when it's just they're hiring someone, that feels a little... Not scummy, but like kind of glad handy. Can you just, you kind of go up there and you see all the administrators and all given that administrator like grin and just patting each other on the back. Like it just feels very 1%. To me, it's kind of always bothered me like across the board. Like I don't care if you have ties to the school or not. If you donated to the school, it's kind of like I appreciate your monetary contribution and and God only knows what they do with that money. But essentially, it's like you're buying a degree. And you know me, like I fully believe that you need to earn what you get. You know what I mean? And as you mentioned, a lot of us spend tens of thousands of dollars on these degrees and Yeah, I'm sure the celebrity could afford that, but like you're just handing it to them. I don't know. It just really bothers me. Listen, we can do a whole episode and we probably will at one point about what all these schools do with their money. Because if it's a school like Ohio State, I have a 99% of the time it's going toward either firing a coach or trying to buy a coach, you know, being funneled to some running back or quarterback or athlete who aren't quote unquote employees of the school, even though they're basically walking advertisements for the school. I also would say too, like it would feel, I don't know if I would necessarily feel good if it's a donor getting it either. Then it just feels like you're buying influence. You're buying control over the school. Or your name on a building. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, we can do a whole episode about mega donors and kind of the influence that they buy, you know, again, one of the kind of really underlying things with Ohio State with this whole situation is the mega donor who basically runs the town and runs the city almost like a fiefdom and every, and basically everyone's afraid to cross him. He basically funds the entire operation there. And there's even like celebrities that I really like. Like, I think Jon Stewart, I believe he has an honorary degree from somewhere. And as much as I love him, it's like, oh, don't love that. It feels like a gig. Yeah. It feels like a handout, too, to somebody that doesn't need it. Give it to somebody that does need it. They can't afford it, you know? Does it make any difference to you if the school paid them as a speaker or not? I feel like that's a slippery slope too, though. Well, I'm not, I'm, Alyssa, I understand the slippery slope. I'm with, like just starting from that premise. Just paying them to give the speech or paying them and then they get an honorary degree? If, say, if they weren't paying them at all and they gave them an honor, honorary degree. 
Yeah, it's still, I just, I go back to the principle of you didn't earn it. You didn't do all the work. You didn't go to class. You didn't have all the stress of it. Like, no, you didn't earn it. Because I, I kind of come down the same way that it, I don't think it really matters whether or not they get paid for it or not. It's still the same thing. If they were either just paid to speak or they just spoke, would you feel any differently? I honestly don't love that they get paid to speak the ones that do. I don't know. I feel like you should, if you make it to a certain level of success in your life, you should want to give that back to somebody else. Do you know what I mean? Like you should want to do this of the kindness of your heart, tell them about the lessons you've learned, inspire them to try to get to whatever level you're at. Do you know what I mean? So I, I think I appreciate those speakers more. I don't know. I, yeah, it's just, it's a little cringy to me. I think if you saw less pop culture people giving the commencement speeches and you saw more, I mean, I don't necessarily think politicians, but if you saw like more authors, more humanitarians giving speech, I think that would make, I think I would feel better about that. I may even feel better about paying them because odds are that money is going to be reinvested in a better way. But don't you see it though, as just an honor in and of itself? Like, why do you need something monetary behind it? You know what I mean? Like if you're asked to do that, then again, you're at a certain level in your life where it's like, all right, people want to hear from you. Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pay them either. I would feel better about giving them an honorary degree. If you wanted to make a donation in their name to a charity, that I would probably be okay with. Yeah, that I would feel better about, yeah. So we want to know what you think, as always. Email us at the Tell Me About Podcast at gmail.com. Tell us your commencement stories. Tell us about if, if you had a speaker at your school, if you remember anything about it, if they were someone famous or notable. Watch our Instagram and our YouTube at the Tell Me About Podcast. We will be updating those. Uh, so keep an eye out for, for new content there. So we're going to be back with a new episode in two weeks. And that's going to be a Laura episode. It's going to be a pretty interesting story. It, we're going to go back to like late 90s, early 2000s again. And, and I have a pretty interesting story to tell you. And with that, as always, we thank you for listening, and we will talk to you next time. Bye, guys.